This video is intended for entertainment and historical purposes only. It's not meant to be an instructional tutorial or provide professional advice. Today we're going to take delivery of a new piece of two foot gauge equipment. But first, we're going to get engine number two mobile and roll it out of the way and onto my raised section of track. Number two needs to get completely torn down before we can send it out for sandblasting. But for this to happen, I need to be able to squeeze underneath it to drop the brake rigging and binders so we can lift it off its wheels. Where it's currently sitting, I can just squeeze under the firebox, but there's no chance of fitting under the axles. I have no idea how long it's been since the engine last rolled anywhere. So to avoid potentially damaging anything, we're gonna drop the rods and the Stevenson Link valve gear before moving it. Most people think that Robert Stevenson the man behind 1829's most sophisticated locomotive, known as the Rocket, invented Stevenson Link valve gear. But this isn't actually true. William Howe and William Williams actually developed it while working for Stevenson in 1841. Although it looks complicated, Stevenson valve gear is incredibly simple once you understand how it works. In a nutshell, the valve gear is driven off four eccentrics which are mounted to the main axle. Each eccentric has a two-piece eccentric strap and eccentric blade which transforms the rotary motion of the eccentric into a rocking motion at the link. The link is basically the steam locomotive's transmission. The link block rides inside the link and its purpose is to transmit the rocking motion through the aptly named rocker arm to the valve rod where it becomes linear motion moving the valve back and forth via the valve stem. Here's what all this looks like in action. Each eccentric is in a slightly different position on the axle and serves the singular purpose of operating its side of the engine either forward or reverse, albeit in one direction only. The left side rod is solid having zero lost motion in any direction, whereas the right side rod has all sorts of slack. This can be caused by a multitude of things, from plain old worn out rod brasses on the right side, or overly tight brasses on the left, to something much more complicated, like the engine being out of tram. To be in tram means that all the wheels of the locomotive are square to each other, front and back, and side to side, and perfectly in line with the cylinders. If an engine is out of tram, you may encounter binding like what we see with the left side rod. Operating or even moving an engine that's out of tram can cause excessive wear and should be avoided wherever possible. I'm not going to go into detail about dropping the side rods right now, but if you'd like a step-by-step -step explanation, pause the video here and go back and check out episode 11. For everyone else who's done this with me before, did you notice the interesting difference between the two locomotives' rods, specifically the bearing wedges? It's really fun to see little differences between two essentially identical locomotives that were manufactured only six years apart. I imagine some of you are wondering why I'm using such a wimpy little hammer to do what I'm doing. Basically, an undersized hammer like this is less likely to hurt something, but will still mostly get the job done. Whatever the little hammer can't do, the sledgehammer and a block of wood certainly can. On Christmas Day of 1936, five-year-old Ben and six-year-old Jimmy woke up to locomotive number two sitting in their backyard on a short stretch of track. Their father had purchased the engine from an unknown source and had it delivered to the house late on Christmas Eve. It was to take the place of the electric train under the Christmas tree and would eventually provide the boys and their friends countless hours of enjoyment. By 1956, the boys were all grown up and had moved away. Now having no one to entertain, the little engine no longer had a purpose and was sold for scrap on July 18th of that year. For the 20 years the engine served as a backyard plaything, it was kept well painted, which did an excellent job of preserving it. But all this thick paint sure makes things like the rod bolts and straps hard to come apart. 
If you look really close, you can see the remains of the original Davenport paint, which is a slightly different hue compared to everything else. This shows us that the rods were originally painted black when it came from the factory. That makes sense. Construction dinkies could hardly expect their moving parts to get oiled, let alone having unpainted rods maintained from rusting. The sped up footage makes it look like I'm hitting things harder than I actually am. In reality, I'm just lightly tapping everything apart. All the individual pieces are laid out on the bench as they came apart. This time, they aren't getting reassembled until after they've been cleaned and all the old paint has been stripped away. Moving over to the Stevenson valve gear now. Here's the underside of the four eccentric straps, each with a hard to access double nutted bolt. The eccentric blades are attached to the links with threaded pins and held tight with one nut each. The nuts should each have a cotter pin to keep them from coming loose, but as usual, some do and some don't. The pin head is completely round, so vice grips are used to hold it while the nuts are unscrewed. Aside from the eccentric blade nuts being a little awkward to access, everything is coming apart as though it was assembled yesterday. I have a feeling that these pins were renewed at least once during the engine's working life. They seem like they're made out of a higher quality material compared to the other parts, and their corresponding holes have been brought back to standard with brass bushings. Of course, things would be far too easy if I didn't have to drill out at least one cotter key. If you look close, you can see the links are made out of four pieces, held together with two bolts. When you're hammer testing an engine like this, it's very important to always check these bolts for tightness. Working between the boiler and the frame made the upper eccentric bolts somewhat easier to access compared to the other valve gear parts. The nice thing about such a small locomotive is that no matter how awkward something is to access, it's never more than arm's length away from you. The eccentric straps are now carefully taken apart, being ever cautious not to drop or lose any of their shims along the way. This was all done by feel, as I couldn't see anything while I was doing it. This shot shows another interesting difference between the two locomotives. Notice how the spring hangers don't have any shoes. If you go back and have a look at episode 11, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Something to keep in mind regarding Stevenson Link valve gear is whether or not the engine uses an open or crossed eccentric blade design. As you can see here on the Davenport blueprint, the outside blade goes to the bottom of the link and the inside blade goes to the top of the link, making a sideways V shape. If we were to flip things around and connect the outside blade to the top and the inside blade to the bottom, it would create a sideways X shape, otherwise known as crossed blades. If we were to accidentally cross the blades during reassembly, it would cause the engine to back up when the Johnson bar was set for forward and go forward when the Johnson bar was set for reverse. Everything gets laid out on the bench to await cleaning and a fresh coat of paint. All the parts associated with the Stevenson valve gear seem to be in really good shape. None of the pins or brass bushings show any signs of being worn, and the eccentric straps were snug and free from lost motion. We now have a good opportunity to look at the eccentrics on engine number two. Compare that with engine number one's bare axle where the eccentric should be. Additionally, this is what's left of number one's only remaining eccentric. Prior to acquiring number two, this beat up chunk of cast iron was all I had to work from in designing the new split eccentrics for number one. Of course, this one wasn't always split, 
that came later during the disassembly up at the mine. Now that the rods and valve gear are on the bench, it's time to move the engine ahead. I lubricated the crown brasses and axle journals off camera and then proceeded to give the engine a gentle tug with my pickup. With number two out of the way, we're ready for the new piece of equipment to arrive. Thanks to a couple channel viewers, I was offered the remains of a two foot gauge side dump gravel car by the museum in Issaquah, Washington. The little car had been partially restored by one of the museum's volunteers. However, the restoration stopped due to uncertainty around the design of the dump box. I'll explain this in just a minute, but first let me give you a little context. On January 16th, 1874, a 46-year-old Civil War veteran and inventor named Colonel Francis Peetler filed a patent application for a new and improved gravel car for use on light railways. This simple patent was the first of many for what became the Peetler Portable Railway Manufacturing Company. Peetler's main claim to fame was their patented side dump gravel car, which used a floating door design. This design used vertical arms to support the doors and keep them tight to the car body when not dumping. During the dumping process, the car body would tip at a 45 degree angle, totally independent of the doors. The vertical arms hold one door open while keeping the other door shut. This was accomplished by connecting the lower pivot arm which tipped with the car body to the horizontal door arms by way of the vertical arms which acted as a fulcrum. Finally, the upper pivot arms were used to keep everything in line and rigid. This whole operation was controlled by workers who would trip pelican hooks on the opposite side of the car they wanted to dump from. Each car had four of these pelican hooks located at each corner. Depending on how the load was balanced, the dump car would either immediately tip over or it would require a slight nudge from the workers. I don't know about you, but I find watching the simple operation of these cars to be totally fascinating. They're so incredibly simple, but also so complicated at the same time. Over the life of Peetler's patent, numerous companies tried to copy the design by coming up with slightly different mechanisms, but nothing really caught on. Sometime around the turn of the century, the original patent expired and there was a flood of companies who instantly copied the floating door design. From what I can tell, this is what caused Peetler to rethink its door design, which led to a number of oddball creations, which as you'll see later, includes my new gravel car. Having no dump box, the little car frame was light enough that two of us could easily push it out of the storage building without any trouble. The concrete floor made steering a breeze, and within minutes, the car was on the street at a 90 degree angle to my trailer. A floor jack and an engine hoist were employed to turn the car on a dime. The trailer winch made quick work of loading the car and I was on the road in no time. I wanna give a huge thank you to the folks at the Issaquah Museum for kindly donating the gravel car and a few hundred pounds of spare gravel car parts to the project. If you're ever passing through Issaquah, consider paying them a visit. There's a link to their website in the video description in case you'd like to learn a little bit more about them and what they do. Immediately after unloading the car, I was like a kid with a brand new Tonka dump truck. I just had to give it a try. As you can see, there really isn't much to these cars. They're mostly made from angle iron with a wood center frame that the draft gear and center pivots bolt to. The wheels on this car are 14 inches in diameter and use plain journal bearings. And as it sits, the most complicated part of the car are the four Pelican hooks. As I mentioned earlier, the museum also sent a pile of spare parts home with me including four center pivots, three and a half draw heads, eight door hinges, and many other parts yet to be identified.
Most exciting of all were the four gravel card journal boxes with their bearing brasses still in place that were a perfect match for the gravel car wheels I previously collected. In all, the Issaquah Museum provided me with enough parts to complete two and a half Peatler gravel cars. However, before I can do that, I need to figure out how the door and what I assume is the locking mechanism actually works. The door hinges are nearly identical to the ones shown in a 1906 Peatler patent. But the center pivots are completely different on my car. Additionally, this car has four castings mounted at each corner inside the frame. And two more similar castings mounted inside the center cross member. There is also a lock of some sort on either side of the dump frame. All these parts look very similar to a 1902 Peatler patent. Having only the patents and a few grainy photographs is going to make replicating the missing parts pretty tough. I'm hoping one of you might know of some existing Peatler gravel car blueprints, or even better, an existing car similar to this one. Even photographs would be incredibly helpful. Shoot me an email at rec to restored at gmail.com if you know of anything that might be useful. Thanks for watching right to the end of the episode. If you enjoyed the video, think about leaving a comment and giving it a like. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really helps the channel grow. For anyone interested in contributing directly to the project, you can find a link to my Patreon page in the channel and video description. I also want to give a big shout out to everyone who's already joined the Patreon page.